Certainly. The hearing is in the matter of CFI 25-2022 before Justice Lord Angus Glenny and is being held by way of video conference. Any orders or directions made after during the course of this hearing will be uh, issued by the registry in Dubai on the judge's instruction. The claimants are represented by Brian K. Vlayton Paisner, LLP, and the lead counsel Alexander Burl. The defendant is represented by Mohammed Asarkal, advocates and legal consultant, and the lead counsel is Yash Behru. Thank you very much. Yes, very well. Um, if you're all ready, we'll begin. Uh, Mr. Barrow, is that for you to go first? Yes, good morning, um, Your Honour. Yeah. Uh, I appear on behalf of, of the applicant, and my learned friend, Mr. Burrow, appears on behalf of the respondent. Yeah. Uh, as Your Honour will be aware, this is my client's application uh, brought pursuant to the um, RDC Rules 12.1 to challenge the jurisdiction of the court yeah. to try the claims brought against it. Um, Your Honour, if I may begin by turning to kind of the, the main document that Will be relevant for today which is the spa yes. um, if i can ask you to bring that up it's it's b14 is the start of it in the bundle and i think i can direct you yep. to that page um so your honor i'd like to start at b16 which sets out the particulars of, of the transaction which concerns the spa uh, we can see at point one the seller that is the respondent today dr rothman the, the purchaser is um, listed as the applicant, which is my client. It refers yes. to number three to the property, which is uh, the heart of the transaction. Number five, importantly, is the purchase price, which is set at 110 million um, dirhams. <coughs> number six and seven um, set up how that 110 million is to be made up. It's, it's a cash balance of 66 million, um, which comprises a, a mortgage repayment plus anything that's left over um, against the sum of 66 million. And number seven is a subscription amount, which forms the other part of that consideration for 44 million dirhams, mm -hmm. uh, which is payable by the issuance and allotment of certain subscription shares, 13, just over 13.4 million of them. Um, if I ask your honor to move on to um, clause seven, which is a B27, And again, I'll, I think I can direct everyone to this. Uh, clause seven in the SPA, as you will see, deals with the subscription element um, of, of the agreement between the parties. I'm not going to take your honor through all of it, but what this sets up here is effectively the rights that are to arise as a subscriber under the agreement. And clause point seven, seven in particular on the next page, um, sets out a provision for um, at 7.71, where at the discretion of the seller, if, if the shares aren't issued and delivered within 60 days, that then either a cash equivalent can be paid or that the property is, is returned as part of the transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving on to 17.13, which is at B36, um, this is really the heart of, of, of the claim. Um, it's a provision within that falls under the, the general provisions of the SPA, where it says the purchaser agrees and undertakes that if the purchaser is not listed. Hold, hold, list hold on a sec. Page 36. B, B36, sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah, OK. Yep. Um, I've, I've directed your honour to the page insofar as you haven't got it. 17.13, um, your honour, is, is obviously the heart of this claim. The purchaser agrees and undertakes that if the purchaser is not listed on any stock exchange within 18 months of the transfer date, the purchaser shall immediately pay to the seller a sum equal to the subscription amount, and the seller shall thereafter immediately transfer the participating shares. It was allotted pursuant to this agreement back to the purchaser. Um, yeah. Your Honour, forgive me, there's one clause I've missed out, which is a key clause, which is clause four, which deals with the purchase price and the mechanism through which consideration was going to be paid. That's at B25. And I'll, I have it. I'll direct um, your honour to that relevant page. Um, it's 4.1. The consideration payable for the sale of the property to the purchaser shall be the purchase price, which shall be satisfied and discharged in full as follows. The settlement of the Sharjah Islamic Bank mortgage repayment amount by way of bank mortgage manager's check issued in favour of SIB payable on the transfer date and 
4.1.2, the remaining cash balance shall be paid by the purchaser on the transfer date by way of a bank manager's check. And then 4.1.3, the allotment and issue of the subscription shares to the subscriber on the transfer date. Um, so that's clause four. And then finally, clause 18, which I'm sure your honor has, has seen from both my skeleton and my landed friend's skeleton, as well as the SPA, which is a B36 sets out two separate um, jurisdiction clauses. 18.1.1, um, <coughs> excuse me, 18.1.1, the parties acknowledge and agree as follows, a dispute or claim arising out of or in connection with the transfer or registration of, or which is, in, is otherwise in connection to the property shall be governed and construed in accordance with the laws and regulations of the Emirates of Dubai and the federal laws of the UAE, as applied in the Emirates of Dubai and the courts of Dubai shall have exclusive jurisdiction to settle any dispute of the claim. And 18.1.2, a dispute or claim arising out of or in connection with the subscriber as a unit holder or shareholder or member of the purchaser, however described or defined, shall be governed by and construed in accordance with the laws and regulations of the DIFC and the courts of the DIFC shall have exclusive jurisdiction to settle any dispute or claim. Um, mm -hmm. But that's where the heart of the dispute lies. It, my submission is that when one looks at the nature of the claim brought by the respondents, it falls under 18.1.1 and therefore the onshore courts have jurisdiction. And mm -hmm. my uh, and, and his argument is that no, this is a claim which arises in connection with the subscriber as a unit holder, and therefore the DIFC court is the one that has um, jurisdiction. And, and my lord, I've identified that kind of single issue of paragraph nine of my skeleton for your reference. Yep. And so that's the issue the court needs to dispose of in order to, to consider my client's application. And uh, mm. I think if, if I was to put it simply, it's on a proper interpretation of these two clauses. Um, 18.1 in favour of Dubai courts, 18.1.2 in favour of DIFC courts, does the claim fall within the exclusive jurisdiction of this court or the onshore courts? Um, and that, to dispose of that issue, what the court's going to have to do today is, is properly classify or, or categorise the claim brought by the respondent, i.e. determine if it's in connection with the property or or um, <laughs> with the subscriber as a unit holder. Um, it's it's not a particularly lengthy or, or complicated point, um, Your Honour, but before I, I turn to my submissions as, as to why the respondent's claim is one bought in respect of the property, it might be um, useful for me to at least briefly deal with the principles. I don't intend to spend too long on this. Um, is, there any, is there any dispute between you on principles of construction? Um, th there isn't. Uh, there is not what I would call a practical or material dispute. Um, I, I think the first point is, which which I take to be agreed from paragraph 23 of my land of friends skeleton, is that the jurisdiction clause is to be interpreted in accordance with the laws that governs it, which would mean 18.1.1 should be interpreted under the laws of the UAE, and 18.1.2 should be governed under the laws of the DIFC. My land of friends says... You're, you're both agreeing that there's no difference between those laws? No, there, there, there isn't, in my submission at least, there's no practical or material difference because both of these laws, at least on the issue of contractual interpretation, um, both sets of laws require the court to give effect and meaning to the words of the contract provisions where they are clear and unambiguous. And where yeah. there is effectively a competing interpretation, then under both laws, the court um, should look to the objective common intention of the parties. Uh, yeah. So from that point of view, there's materially no difference. Um, my learned friend says when you're looking at the rest of the contract and construing it, you have to look at a potential conflict of laws that exist between the two of them, and DIFC is the one that should prevail. My response to that is there materially is no difference, but I've set out in my skeleton effectively the six principles that I submit the court should follow when actually construing the, the clauses. Um, that's set out at paragraphs 15 onwards of my skeleton argument. I don't propose to take your lordship through it. Um, it. Um, and well, my lord, and so far as anything becomes contentious um, during my learned friend's reply, then I'll, I'll take you through the relevant provisions. Um, but I say that's the framework through which the court must look at the relevant clauses when considering which jurisdiction is appropriate. My lord, moving on to my main submissions, um, I, I have four of them in support of my application. 
Uh, my primary submission is that the claim concerns a core provision of the SPA, which is in connection with the property itself, rather than concerning the subscriber as a unit holder. I just is, is, is that is that say that more slowly if I'm going to make a note of it. I, I'm sorry, Your Honour, I didn't quite hear. If you if you say it a bit more slowly, I can make a note uh, of it. Yes, of course, yes. It's it's paragraphs twenty nine to thirty of my schedule right. with this point. Um, and I say the claim is in connection with the property because clause seventeen point thirteen yeah. is one part of the core bargain and the contractual provisions which define the consideration payable by my clients for the sale of the property. Uh, and if one was to take a stand back, Your Honour, by pursuing this claim, what the respondent in my submission is, is seeking is to be paid the balance of forty four million which form part of the purchase price of 110 million for the property. And, and this becomes apparent when one tracks through the relevant clauses for the purchase of the property. So under clause two, to begin with, which can be found at B24, should your honor want to look at it, um, <coughs> the respondent seller undertakes to sell and the applicant purchaser undertakes to purchase the property for the purchase price, which is defined at 110 million dirhams. At uh, clause four, this provides the mechanism through which the purchase price shall be satisfied and discharged. And that was formed of three elements as we looked at before. The first is the repayment of the existing mortgage to Sharjah Islamic Bank. The second is a check for the difference between 66 million and the mortgage redeemed with the bank. And the third mm -hmm. is the facing shares which have been ascribed a value of, of 44 million dirhams. Now, clause 17.13 in my submission modifies clause 4.13, i.e. the participating shares, by providing that if the applicant is not listed on a stock exchange by an agreed long stock date, then the shares are no longer valid consideration and the applicant is compelled to pay 44 million dirhams in cash. Following that payment, it will then be returned the shares. So the obligation at 17.13 is not a, a contingent or discretionary one, it's, it's mandatory. It, it is automatic in its trigger at the long stop date, which is that um, the shares are no longer deemed valid consideration and therefore the cash equivalent must be paid. So for that reason, in my submission, I say that we're concerned with a claim relating to consideration due as part of the purchase price for the property and therefore the claim is one that arises in connection with the property making it subject to the jurisdiction clause at 18.1.1 and therefore subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the onshore courts. Um, the second submission that I wish to make is, is in relation to the use of language in clause 17.13 itself to describe the obligations of a seller and a purchaser rather than the obligations of a seller and subscriber. And I say that that is quite important. And I've set up my submissions on that at 31 to 34 of my skeleton. But if, if I may just deal with the, that matter in three points. Firstly, the use of seller in clause 17.13, rather than the use of the term subscriber, which is a defined term in the SPA, is significant. Uh, and in my submission, it indicates that that clause is concerned with the respondent as a party to the sale of the property, i.e. the seller, rather than as an investor or a party to the subscription agreement, i.e. the subscriber. Now, as I say, while the subscriber is defined as the seller in the SPA, the SPA itself does make a distinction in some of the provisions between the use of seller and subscriber. And that is most clearly seen from clause seven, which can be found at B27 of the bundle. <coughs> um, <clears throat> and we can see clause seven does refer in, in its, its, its various provisions, it does refer to subscriber when it's concerned with the seller in the capacity as a subscriber, and otherwise only refers to the respondent as the seller, which is in its capacity as the seller of the property. And clause point 7.5 euro is probably the clearest example of this. If I just read it out, the purchaser acknowledges and undertakes to the seller 
that no further consideration or payments, including without limitation any subscription fees, shall be payable by the subscriber to the purchaser, the fund manager or Apex in connection with the subscription. And the purchaser hereby indemnifies the subscriber in respect of all consideration, payment and fees. Now, in other words, the purchaser is providing the undertaking to the seller as contracting parties to the SPA, but the parties have chosen to refer to the seller as the subscriber when addressing payments made in the seller's capacity as a subscriber. And therefore, the capacity in which the party owes an obligation under each clause, in my submission, is relevant. And clause 17.13, the obligations are clearly set out as being obligations owed by the purchaser to the seller and not owed by the purchaser to the subscriber. So therefore, I say the, the language used in clause 17.13 also assists my client's case in saying this is a claim in respect or in connection with the property. The third point that, or the third submission I wish to make, which is linked to my previous submission, Your Honour, is the fact that um, the respondent seller happens to be the subscriber and will lose his subscriber status once the shares are transferred back to the purchaser. But that does not in itself, in my submission, convert the claim from one dealing with outstanding consideration for the property into a claim about a subscriber as a unit holder. And I say that's purely coincidental. And I say that primarily for two reasons, which I've set out in detail in my skeleton of paragraph 35. But the first reason is that um, it goes to the point I've just made, which is the distinction the S SPA itself makes in describing the responder as a seller and not a subscriber in clause 17.13 contrary to other provisions in the SPA where it has made that distinction. Um, and the second point is that the obligation in clause 17.13, when one looks at it, is for the purchaser to transfer 44 million dirhams to the seller. Following that payment being made, this then triggers the transfer of the participating shares from the seller to the purchaser. And clause 17.13 would still at least in my submission, serve its purpose, even if the participating shares were no longer held by the seller, if it was held, for example, by a third party. Uh, and Your Honour, I think I can demonstrate this with the example of if the seller, i.e. the respondent had incorporated, for example, a limited company uh, to hold the shares, the participating shares in my client, well, in that instant, the respondent seller would no longer be a subscriber as he would not, in fact, hold the shares. But in, in those circumstances, um, I submit that it is clear that if the respondent seller sought to enforce his right to receive the 44 million dirhams in cash under clause 17.13, he would be enforcing his entitlement to consideration under that clause rather than it being anything to do with his um, status as a subscriber, as a unit holder. Therefore, under that scenario, what would happen is the clause would be triggered, the payment would be made, and then after the payment is made, um, the seller, or not the seller, whoever's holding the shares, would have to transfer the shares back at the seller's direction. So, for example, if it's a limited company that he's incorporated, he would have to effect that transfer back. But he doesn't need to be the subscriber in order for that clause to be operative. And that's why we say it clearly is more to do with consideration for the property, i.e. modifying clause 4.1.3, rather than having anything to do with his um, status as a subscriber, as a, as a unit holder. Um, and my final point that I wish to make in, in support of my client's application is, is to do with the structure of the SPA itself and, and where clause 17.13 is, is set out. And in my submission, that is worthy of consideration because generally speaking, it's necessary for the, the court to assess the clause in dispute in the context of the contract as, as a whole. Now, in respect of clause 17.13, um, that is, or, or sorry, clause 17.13 is not set out under clause 7, for example, which specifically deals with the subscription element of this agreement and the respondent's rights as a subscriber. So it's not dealt with under clause seven, which was specifically delineated within the SPA to deal with the subscription rights and, and the subscriber's rights. Rather, it's located in, in a separate part of the SPA that deals with the general provisions 
it's it's under clause 17 which itself is labeled as the general um i think it's just labeled general at page b34 and many of the obligations <laughs> falling under clause 17 are standard form clauses dealing with for example we have um notice clauses at 17.1.2 uh, third party rights clauses at 17.4, waiver clauses at 17.5, variation clauses at 17.6, counterparts clauses at 17.9 and, and onwards. There are other sub clauses within the, the general classification of clause 17 that are not standard form clauses, but they still go to and define the bargain between the parties for the sale of the property. And, and one example of that that I can give is 17.10, uh, which deals with the rights of entry. Um, so following on from that, in, in my submission, clause 17.13 falls into the latter category of a general clause in, in going to the bargain agreed by the parties for the sale of the property. Had it been intended to be specifically about the subscription status or, or the rights as a subscriber, it would have been appropriately dealt with under clause uh, 7 or a separate clause altogether. So in my submission, the disputes arising from all of the additional contractual obligations in clause 17, they fall more naturally under clause 18.1.1, being disputes which are otherwise in connection to the property, rather than clause 18.1.2, um, being disputes in connection with the subscriber as a, as a unit holder. Um, my Lord, the, the, those, those are my the four main points for why we say this claim is in connection with the property. I just wish to address some of the points made by the respondent, uh, both yep. in their evidence and in the skeleton argument. Um, some of these will overlap with the points that I've already made. But the, the first point that I wish to say is that the respondents um, in my submission are taking what is a rather a blinkered uh, a, a, and unrealistic view about what the SPA means and what this claim is about. For example, at paragraph um, 10 of my learned friend's skeleton, which is at E2, Hold on so what my learned friend says there is, is that the remaining <laughs> relationship under the SPA relates solely to the participating share since the completion of the purchase. And I say that that isn't correct and it misunderstands the SPA and its, and its terms as there are clauses in the SPA, such as clause 17.10 that I referred to earlier, relating to the right of entry, which are clearly related to the property. So it's not a case of everything to do with the property is, is done once the purchase is complete. There's a lot that survives there. So I say that takes an unnecessarily blinkered view towards how the SPA operates. Um, the other point, the first point he makes in respect of his substantive submissions is, is set out at paragraph 35 and it goes on uh, until paragraph 39 and the reference for that starts at E8. But the gist of it, Your Honour, is that clause, he says that clause 18.1.1 was intended solely to relate to the mechanics of the legal transfer and registration of the property. And he says at paragraph 37 of his skeleton that this is demonstrated by three things. The first is um, the respondents say it is in line with common usage in the region. The second point they make is that clause 18.1.1 provides that it applies to disputes arising out of or in connection with the transfer and registration. And the third point uh, is that he relies on matters stated during preliminary negotiations. And in my submission, the respondent is, is not right on, on any of those points as a matter of interpretation, fact and, and law. And what it does is take an unnecessary narrow approach to interpreting clause 18.1.1, which ignores the actual wording of the clause. Um, and I just want to take your lordship back to the clause at B36. Just to highlight the, the words that are ignored leading to that interpretation. Um, Hold on. Yep. So you're on 18.1.1 at B36. Um, 
a dispute or claim arising out of or in connection with the transfer or registration of. So that's the first part which, which the respondents focus on to say that's effectively the narrow interpretation and that's all the clause is limited to. But it ignores the second part, or which is otherwise in connection to the property shall be governed by and construed and it goes on. Um, so that clause in my submission is, is absolutely clear and unequivocal in its terms. It does not limit itself to issues arising from as the respondents say, the transfer or registration, um, it, it's any issues which is otherwise in connection with the property. And clause 18.1.1 is a broader clause than 18.1.2, as not only does it encompass a dispute or claim arising out of or in connection with the transfer or registration of the property, mm -hmm. the same wording as is used in clause 18.1.2 in relation to the subscriber as a unit holder, shareholder or member, but it also includes a dispute or claim which is otherwise in connection to the property. And, and we say that is an all-encompassing expression. And I've well, I, understand, my... I understand that the width yeah. of that is a wide wording. It's so wide that it would include every dispute under this agreement, wouldn't it? It would, and that's what we say happens. That's, that's the problem though, because the parties are clearly not intended to include every dispute. Well, so what do, you, what do you say that the demarcation line is? The demarcation line, it, the most visible um, example of it, Your Honour, would be Clause 7, which specifically deals with subscriber rights, the subscription agreement. It, well, it's but, a why, right. but why wouldn't that, um, why couldn't that be said to uh, be otherwise in connection with the pro in connection to the property, because what clause seven sets out, Your Honour, is the specific rights as a subscriber, and eighteen point one point two clearly is intended to deal with issues arising from those subscription rights. So, therefore, yes. if it was a claim under clause seven, I would say we would have difficulties in saying it's not intended to be under the jurisdiction of the DIFC, because clearly. So I'm just approaching it the other way. Um, would you accept that a claim under Clause 7, leave aside the words of 18.1.2, but a claim under Clause 7 could well fit within your interpretation of otherwise in connection to the property? It could fit into the mind okay. So uh, therefore, the words, the words otherwise in connection with the property don't necessarily have as wide a meaning as you you would you initially submitted. Well, you know, I, I would say it, it does. I, I I don't think it. Could, I don't think we can ignore the fact that there are the two separate clauses, and I don't think we can ignore the fact that clause seven does more naturally fit into eighteen point one point two. Although my learned friend says actually it fits into more naturally into eighteen point one point one, and I say well if it's the case of Clause 7 fits into 18.1.1, i.e. 7.7 .7, um, modifies 4.13 in respect of the consideration. Then 17.13 yeah. more neatly fits into that because it, it's completely detached from dealing with any subscription rights as such. It's merely dealing with consideration of the property itself. So yeah. we say 18.1.1 is an all encompassing expression uh, and that can capture everything, including the, the claim that's currently been bought. 18.1.2 um, has to specifically deal with something that relates to your rights as a subscriber, i.e. Your, your interest in the participation shares. It has to be specifically linked to a subscriber. And if we're dealing with a clause, for example, um, well, what, what, what I can do, Your Honour, is, is kind of I'm not sure it's entirely helpful, but we can go through the SPA to look at what kinds of claims would fall under each category and then and the court would have to classify each one. But in, in principle, if 18.1.1 is effectively the default provision dealing with the entirety of the transaction in the SPA, then that's where dispute should readily fall un into unless it's absolutely clear that it is intended to fall under 18.1.2. And that is only where it's a dispute otherwise in connection with the subscriber as a unit holder. And we say the claim that's currently been brought, A, is not uh, to deal with the subscriber as a unit holder, 
But in any event, it, it's absolutely unclear on what basis they say it is only limited to that. Um, <coughs> so, my lord, the, the next point in, in, in respect of that is, is the respondents rely on um, preliminary or, or the prior negotiations yeah. that have taken place between the parties. And, and, and my point on that, and I'm, I, I may need to take it to some of the authorities on it, is that that's um, not properly founded because evidence about pre-negotiations is generally inadmissible. The court is, is generally concerned only to look at the executed agreements um, and where there is a dispute as to interpretation to look at what the party's common intentions were by reference to what a reasonable person circumstance in the same position would have understood it to be. The yeah. court's role is generally not to go back and look at um, pre-negotiations or draft agreements, which is what the respondents uh, are proposing. If I can briefly take you to the authorities that deal with it. Um, yeah. First of all, I, I rely on um, an English authority, which I um, submit is, is provides useful guidance and is persuasive for this court. It's the case of Investors Confiscation Scheme and West Bromwich Building Society. Um, it's we, a, we have to, I mean, the, the law is pretty pretty clear on this area, isn't it? It's pretty clear on it, my lord. Well, I, I, I don't, perhaps I can then just give you the reference for, for your own purposes. It's, it's page 913 of, of that case. I also rely on the John Vitalo and Atlas Mara Management Services case in the DIFC um, at paragraph five, and that's a D146. And I lastly rely on the case, the DIFC case of Mohammed Sadia and Khatib and others, um, which specifically deals with relying on previous iterations of a draft agreement. Uh, and yeah. I rely on paragraph 88, which of that authority, which can be found at D77. Um, so yeah. I, my submission is that the respondents' reliance on prior negotiations to demonstrate an alleged common intention of the parties um, is actually contrary to the express, clear and unequivocal wording of, of the clauses in the SPA, and that undermines their position uh, because the evidence is, is generally inadmissible and the court should place no weight on it. Yeah. Um, the next point uh, that my learned friend makes is that he says there is no dispute connected to the property, and I've made my submissions as to why um, we said that isn't correct. Uh, but I refer your lordship again to paragraph 39 of my schedule, which specifically responds to this. Um, the one further point in respect of this that, that, that I wish to address just briefly, and, and I've already touched upon it, is what uh, my learned friend says at paragraphs 44 to 45 of his, of his skeleton, in respect of clause 7.7, .7, uh, where he accepts or seemingly accepts that if a claim had been premised under clause 7.7, .7, then he says it is possible this would have some connection to the property as it concerns unpaid consideration. Um, and, and in my submission, I would submit that if a claim, uh, or at least if my loved friend accepts the claim falling under 7.7 .7 is connected with the property, then so must the claim falling under 17.13. Um, because the way clause 7.7 .7 works is it can only take effect once the parties have actually visited the land department and effected the transfer of the property. But 7.7.1 .7 modifies the consideration due under 4.1.3 to allow for a cash payment in the subscription amount of 44 million, where the shares have not been issued and uh, allotted within the 60 days of the transfer date. And in my submission, clause 17.13 similarly modifies the consideration due under 4.1.3, albeit to a, what I would describe as a cleaner extent, because it really doesn't touch upon any of the subscription related points that clause 7.7 7 .7 generally does. Um, the, the final uh, point that my learned friend makes at paragraphs 48C of his skeleton is, is that, that he points to various words set out in clause 17.13 and he says that the use of these words show that the dispute is in connection with the respondent as a unit holder. Um, however, we don't dispute the interpretation of any of those words and what is said there. What we say is that the dispute is effectively a debt claim for outstanding consideration. Therefore, going into interpreting the very these singular words of a clause don't actually assist anyone. You have to look at the underlying issue. What is the underlying claim? And we say it's one for outstanding consideration. 
Um, so, my lord, the only other point that was made, which which I just want to deal with briefly, is is those instructing me uh, have been criticised both in the evidence as well as in in the respondent's skeleton argument for having initially sent a letter at the start of the proceedings. Uh, identifying the wrong basis on which the jurisdiction was being challenged. They they said that it was um, subject to arbitration. Don't worry about that. Yes, well, I'm sure your Lordship has my point on that. Um, th those conclude my submissions, unless I can assist any further at this stage. No, that's very helpful, thank you. Yes, Mr Burrow. Uh, yes, uh, Your Honour. Um, <clears throat> my own submissions will fall into three parts. Uh, firstly, I'll briefly address uh, the issue of the law which should be applied to the interpretation of the agreement, and in particular, Clause 18. I'll then address the four main submissions made by my learned friend today, and as were detailed in his skeleton. And thirdly, I'll set out the respondent's uh, main arguments three main arguments to the extent that these have not already been dealt with and as are summarised in my skeleton and I'll address some of my learned friends' responses to those as well. So firstly, in terms of interpretation, I think that broadly, and my learned friend and I are on the same page, I think we, we have a, a slightly different analysis to how it's applied. Uh, whilst it is correct that uh, the interpretation clause uh, should be, oh sorry, the, the uh, clause for the governing law of a contract should be dealt with by um, which law is applicable to it. In this case, that's actually not clear because there isn't an agreement as to how the SPA overall or how therefore, 18 is. Therefore, therefore, you say domestic law should, um, the conflict of law rules should, uh, should apply to decide what law governs the interpretation. Indeed, uh, yes, you're right. Yeah, I think you've seen my skeleton. And given there's no difference in onshore law and offshore law on this issue, does it matter? I think there may be one minor difference, and I don't know if, if my learned friend takes takes the point on this, um, which is in particular in relation to the role of pre-contractual negotiations. Under DIFC law, pre-contractual negotiations are specifically pre preserved as being admissible. So I understand um, the conversation or the submissions my learned friend made earlier. That is a point that I disagree on. And I'll address the DIFC court cases that my learned friend relied upon in a moment um, uh, when I get to that relevant point of my submissions. It's not agreed that under DIFC law, uh, pre-contractual negotiations are inadmissible. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll deal with the various authorities my learned friend relies upon. When, when so you've done that, I'll, I'll probably at the end come back and give an opportunity to respond on that because I, I'd rather cut him short. Yes, yes, of, of course, Your Honor. No, I, I completely understand. Um, but I'll, I'll come to those uh, at a later stage. But perhaps that is one of the few areas of difference. Uh, aside from that, there's not a great deal of difference in terms of interpretation, save that uh, very specific uh, factors are set out within the DIFC law at um, Article 51 to be taken into consideration in interpretation. And I don't think it's quite as codified uh, under UAE onshore law. In any event, I'll, I'll move on. The uh, so the second uh, issue I'll, I'll deal with are the four submissions or the four main arguments uh, relied upon by the applicant and I'll deal with them all in turn. The first and perhaps the main point relied upon uh, which is that D9 uh, so paragraphs 29 to 30 of my learned friend skeleton is mm -hmm. that is that the claimant claim in this case under 1713 um, concerns an enforcement of the agreed consideration for the property and as such is in connection with the property rather than the subscriber as a unit holder. And to this end, uh, my learned friend suggests that clause 1713 modifies clause 4.1.3, uh, providing that if the purchase is not listed, the shares are no longer valid consideration and instead the purchase is obliged to pay 44 million. Uh, this position, I submit, is misconceived. Uh, clause 1713 does not concern consideration and is not a modification. This can be demonstrated for four reasons. Uh, firstly, the consideration for the purchase in this case has been fully discharged. As such, 1713 cannot concern consideration. If we go to, to page B25, uh, which is uh, for clause four of the SPA, 
So if we scroll down to the bottom of B25, yeah. we see here, it says at the top, oh, sorry, at 4.1, the consideration payable for the sale of the property to the purchaser shall be the purchase price, which shall be satisfied and discharged in full as follows. And then there's those three items of which were primarily concerned with the third, the allotment and the issue of shares. As such, once the allotment and issue of subscription shares has been successfully completed, the consideration pursuant to clause 4.1 is satisfied and discharged in full. The purchase is complete, consideration paid. The purchase is then irreversible. It's done and any further issues concerning the shares are not consideration because that's already been discharged. Now, secondly, and this is a related point and one that was already set out within my skeleton argument, there is provision within the SPA for when the allotment and issue of set shares is not successful. And as such, the consideration is not discharged in full. And that is not clause 1713, it's clause 7.7. .7. So if we go to B28, we can see here 7.7. .7, if the shares are not issued and allocated to the subscriber or the original share certificates not delivered within 60 days for any reason, and then 7.7.1, uh, at the uh, discretion of the seller, either pay to the seller the value of the subscription shares or retransfer the property. So when the issuance of the shares is not successfully completed, then the, the consideration is not discharged. Now that's not the case in this, in this claim. Two further subpoints arise from clause 7.7. .7. Firstly, this provision allows the respondent to require the retransfer of the property if this isn't fully, uh, if the shares are not issued correctly. As such, this does concern a failure of consideration because you're enabling the retransfer if it's not paid through. This is different to clause 17.13, which does not allow a retransfer of the property. Secondly, this provision provides for payment of the subscription amount, but does not concern the retransfer of the participating shares. So again, at 7.7.1, the shares haven't been issued. As such, it's not a retransfer of shares we're talking about, but it is payment of the value of those shares. So maybe this is uh, related to consideration or a, a, a modification of the consideration payable, but it's not a re transfer of shares and in particular in, in relation to clause 7.7 .7, uh, Dr. Othman the respondent is not a unit holder because the shares haven't been transferred to him by that stage so perhaps a claim under that would not concern him as a unit holder that's different to 1713 when the shares have been successfully transferred and as such when 1713 is engaged uh, it, it is involving a retransfer of shares and as such does involve the respondent as a unit holder. Uh, thirdly, uh, in relation to why uh, 1713 is not related to consideration, as I'll come on to in more detail, 1713 relates to a failure to list on the stock market and a failure to rebuy shares. As such, the obligations relate to the holding of shares, not consideration for property. And I'll build on that in a moment. And fourthly, if 1713 did genuinely concern consideration and was a modification of 4.1, then you would expect it to be contained within um, the section of the agreement which deals with consideration, which might be uh, within section four. And that's related to a point that I'm about to come on to in terms of language. The second point that my learned friend made was that the language in clause 1713 supports the applicant's interpretation. Uh, this is at, I think, D10. So we, 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 where are we? It's uh, uh, page D10, Your Honour. Yes, what, what, what document uh, are we talking about? Uh, para uh, sorry, uh, so this is my learned friend's skeleton argument. Paragraph. Uh, so uh, page D10, paragraph 31 and 32. There's no good giving me the D, D numbers because I... Um... I downloaded this before I, before they were on the system. Shall I try and direct it? I think I've, got the, I've got the paragraph. Okay. Uh, no, I've, I've, download, I've downloaded this, so you won't direct me. You're on. Okay. Um. So the 
the point that my learned friend made uh, within this section of his skeleton and within his submissions today is that uh, within 1713, the respondent is described as the seller rather than the subscriber. Now, my learned friend suggests this use of words is significant and suggests that this illustrates that this clause relates to the purchase of the property, not the subscription. Uh, firstly, to clarify, my learned friend in his skeleton also uh, sets out that within the subscription agreement, which is Schedule 3 of the SPA, the applicant is defined as a REIT, R-E-I-T, and the applicant in 1713 is referred to as the purchaser. Uh, to clarify, uh, nowhere at all within the main body of the SPA, and by which I mean the SPA without the schedules, is the applicant referred to as REIT. They're almost always uh, referred to as the purchaser. Uh, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong on that. But as such, the use of the word purchaser in 1713 is inconsequential because it's the same definition adopted throughout the main body of the SPA. As such, in terms of the wording used and the argument my learned friend makes, we're only focused on the use of the word seller in 1713. My submission is that my learned friend's point uh, or point that the use of the word seller and how this illustrates 1713 relates to property is, is misconceived. This can be demonstrated uh, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, whilst it's correct that there are two definitions for the respondent within the SPA, one subscriber and one seller, and I think as my learned friend referred to earlier, the definition of seller within this SPA is the subscriber, sorry, the definition of subscriber is seller. And also at clause 1.7, so this is at, uh, I have it. Uh, 1.7, any reference to any person or an entity shall include any and all natural or legal persons, including individuals, associations, bodies. Uh, as such, for the purposes of the agreement, it's immaterial as to which, which a definition is used. E either definition refers to the entirety of, of that relevant party. Um, now, so I want to move on to the point that my learned friend suggests, which is that he suggests that the parties did make some sort of distinction between the use of these uh, two uh, different definitions. I mean, in particular, he referred to clause seven. Um, if I could take you there, I think it's at B27. Yep. My learned friend suggested that within this section, which is to do with the subscription agreement, uh, there is a, def a, a distinction in use between the two and one uh, where, it, where it should relate to the subscriber is when the subscriber is used and vice versa. I, I respectfully disagree with that. Um, in particular, we can... So you suddenly... Sorry, Your Honour. You've gone dead. Could you hear me now? I can hear you now. I missed uh, about... Sorry, yeah, sorry. Referring to 7.3.3, Your Honour. Yep. So we see here it says a copy of the updated register of members showing the subscriber's interest shall be delivered to the seller within two, two days of the transfer date. And then in seven, so we're, we're looking at a register of members and then 7.3.4, uh, evidencing the allotment and issue of the subscription shares delivered to the subscriber. Now, again, there's delivery to the seller or the subscriber, use of the same uh, within the two part, same paragraph. In paragraph, uh, sorry, clause 7.2 says here, subject to the seller satisfying the know your client requirements of the fund manager and Apex. Now the fund manager and Apex has to relate to the subscription agreement. Um, and as such, the seller, the purchaser shall not regret and reject and hold the subscription. Um, and relatedly, if we go down to clause 7.6 on bit page B28, at 7.6.1, it says that the purchaser shall hold the subscription shares in trust on behalf and in favor of the seller. Now, holding the shares in trust on, on behalf of the seller, again, this is something that I would suggest would usually relate to the subscriber. And again, at 7.6.2, immediately reimburse the seller in respect of any dividends. Again, it relates to dividends, which would be paid to the subscriber. Uh, again, showing that there's no real or a significant delineation between the two uses of the word. Mm -hmm. um, so 
when the SPA was reviewed, I would suggest there's no real rhyme or reason as to why the parties use one definition or of another. Uh, and even if there is a suggest that it's of limited importance when construing the contracts as a whole. Yeah. 1713 itself, there is use of a considerable amount of uh, textual words which suggests that it is concerned with uh, the subscription, in particular use of the word subscription shares uh, within the title of the clause, reference to stock exchange, subscription amounts and participating shares. As such, the language of this clause illustrates that it relates to the rights of the respondent as a unit holder, not to the pro property purchase. Uh, the second language point my learned friend makes, which is at uh, paragraph 34 of his skeleton, which is page D10. Yeah. And it's, I think it's um, at the very bottom of D10. And it's a point that 18.1.1 uh, is, is allegedly broader than 18.1.2. And he, he refers to the case of, I think, just over the page on D11, uh, that the phrase arising out of or in connection with is an all encompassing expression um, from the case of Airbus. Now, now that's not disagreed, but the, the phrase arising out of or in connection with is also used in 18.1.2. As such, there's no linguistic difference between the two. Both say arising out of or in connection with. As such, both are all encompassing uh, expressions between the two clauses. I understand my, my learned friend suggests that there's also the reference to um, uh, otherwise in connection to, but that just refers to one extra item. So I think it's transfer, uh, registration and the property. Uh, my, my submission is that there's no difference between the phraseology used uh, with it between these two clauses and as, as can be illustrated by um, the, de the finding of, of what that phrase means from Airbus, uh, really this point is just spitting hairs and doesn't advance the applicant's application any further. Uh, the third point that my learned friend refers to is the fact that the seller is the subscriber is irrelevant. Uh, he suggests that, so I think it's at D11, so if we, yeah, just further down, it's the, yeah, the third point set out there. And he suggests that the fact that the respondent will lose subscriber status by transferring the shares is coincidental and does not transfer the claim considering consideration to one as a unit holder. As, I, as I've already discussed, it, the, the respondent disagrees that this is a claim considering consideration. And then dealing with the two points here made by my learned friend, the first one is just a repetition of the, the point I've just dealt with um, in relation to the distinction between seller and subscriber. And the second reason uh, given is, is the example used uh, that my learned friend set out, which is that clause 1713 would still uh, serve its purpose, even if the shares were held by a third party. And now this, this second point I found slightly confused. Uh, the hypothetical given uh, was unclear, is unclear and unhelpful. Clause 1713 wouldn't serve its purpose if, if the shares were held by the third party. Uh, clause 1713, and I think I'll, I'll go to it, it's at D3 within my learned friend skeleton. I have it, yeah. It says here that the seller is to immediately transfer the participating shares. It's not the seller shall affect or... or ensure that the transfers are, are transferred from, from a third party. It's the sellers to transfer the participating shares. The seller is the holder of the shares. If, if the shares were held by a third party, then presumably clause 18.1.2 would be, on my learned friend's um, uh, interpretation, be redundant because the respondent wouldn't be a unit holder. A third party would be the unit holder. As such, 18.1.2 would, would never be used. As such, the, the example given in relation to this is, is, is not very helpful because the respondent is a unit holder and we're concerned with uh, what, uh, it, whether, whether 1713 is connected with him being as, as a unit holder. In my submission, it very clearly is because it's requiring the seller to transfer the shares because he is the unit holder. As such, in my submission, the analogy given doesn't quite work. The... So moving on, and the third, the third, I think, sorry, I might have skipped. No, no. 
The third submission, sorry, the fourth submission that my learned friend makes is that the parties have separated subscription obligations from core obligations in the SPA, um, setting out and suggesting that clause seven is the only section that relates to subscription obligations and that uh, the remainder uh, do not. And as such, clause 17, which is the general section, contains both standard form clauses, but also non-standard that still relate to the property such as 1710. In my submission, uh, these points uh, don't have force and don't advance the applicant's position. Uh, this is for four reasons. Uh, the first of those is if we go to uh, clause 1.9 of the SPA, which is at page B24. Yeah. It says here, uh, clause, paragraph, and schedule headings are for convenience only and may not be used in construing this agreement or any part. As such, in my submission, the fact this clause is contained within a different section to clause seven is immaterial for interpretation purposes. And um, secondly, if, if, if I'm wrong on that, uh, even, if, even if it is correct that 1713 is in a separate part to clause seven, which is the, the main clause in the SPA dealing with subscription obligations, it's also in a separate part to clause four and five, which are the parts of the SPA dealing with the purchase and transfer as such, um, and, and or any other part that may be alleged to concern the property. As such, the exact same point can be made that the parties separated this clause from the parts relating to the property. The, the third point is that it's, it's not correct that clause 17 contains the two categories of clauses that my learned friend suggests, namely um, standard form and then others which relate to the property purchase. That there is in fact only one clause within clause seven or one sub clause within clause 17 which possibly relates to the purchase, which is 1710. Uh, otherwise, the remainder are general, and indeed it's the respondent's case that 1713 is one of the other clauses that relates to the subscription. As such, um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't go uh, one way or the other. Uh, the title of the section is general, uh, in, uh, as, as, as already stated, um, that the title of, of these clauses aren't to be used in interpretation, but it clearly shows that it's, it's not related to one or the other. The fourth point is that my learned friend, uh, as, as already stated, my learned friend suggests that clause seven concerns subscription rights. But, but as I've already stated, uh, clause seven, on, on, on the interpretation that my, my learned friend would suggest in relation to, if it relates to consideration, it relates to the property, clause 7.7 .7 would relate to the property purchase. As such, a clause 18.1.1 would apply to 7.7. .7. As such, the suggestion that um, the parties separated out clause seven as the only clause to which 18.1.2 applies it is misconceived and doesn't quite follow because, as I stated, un under my learned friend's interpretation, 7.7 .7 would certainly apply to 18.1.1. In, in, in summary, my, in my submission, Your Honour, the parties weren't that careful to separate out which parts of the, uh, of the SPA would apply to which parts of the governing law clause. So, so those are my submissions in relation to the the applicant's four points, and and I I, I think my, my, I'm about to come on to my three points, which I think um, uh, shouldn't be as long as I've already dealt with some of my main submissions in any event. Uh, the first of these three points is that the parties intended that eighteen point one point one solely related to transfer or registration. Whilst I accept uh, my learned friend's point, it is correct and 18.1.1 and, um, does contain the words or otherwise in connection with the property. Um, as such, it, it doesn't strictly just reference transfer or registration. However, it's submitted that when this is interpreted objectively, the parties had only intended 18.1.1 to deal with matters relating to the transfer and registration of the property and nothing more. And that's because of the property's location in Dubai and not the DIFC. Uh, the respondent's position on this is set out in detail within my skeleton at paragraph 37. And so I'm not going to try and repeat the contents of that um, in any detail, uh, save to note a, a couple of points. It's commonly understood that the transfer and registration of property in the UAE has to be dealt with under local jurisdiction and law. That is the purpose of 18.1.1. And in line with common usages, a relevant factor in interpreting contracts 
under the contract law. Um, as such, it's submitted that this is what the parties had intended to be the limit of 18.1.1. And indeed, this can be illustrated by the comments used on the previous SPAs. And I think these are set out at page E9 in my skeleton. Um, so I'll go there. So it's page E9, paragraph C. Yeah. So the GII's representatives reference that it's our preference DIFC courts on matters other than registration or transfer. And then Dr. Rothman's representatives comment in response that registration and transfer cannot be DIFC courts and law. As such, those two elements are separated out. So in, in my submission, the comments from the party's representatives in the pre contractual negotiations support the point that, I, that I'm making, which is that the purpose of this clause was for this legal separation because of the requirements of onshore UAE. And that's that's a common, well understood factor. Now, I, I understand in relation to this last point um, and the, the use of pre-contractual negotiations is something disputed. And my learned friend references various case law to suggest that the court should not or, or is not allowed to rely upon the comments made by the parties within the previous SPAs. Uh, to deal with that, I'll separate these out into three different submissions. Uh, the first in relation to English case law, the second in relation to the John Vitalo case, and the third in relation to the Mohammed Sadia case. So firstly, my learned friend Skeleton refers to various English case law to suggest that pre-contractual negotiations are not relevant to interpretation. Um, and as such, uh, they shouldn't be relevant in, these case, in this case. M my submission on this is a very simple one. Uh, these cases are not applicable to uh, interpretation in these proceedings as we're concerned with DIFC law, not English law. And this is one point under which DIFC law diverges from English law. Under DIFC law, and if we can go to page E24, E24. Uh, yes, Your Honour. Now, specifically at Article 51A, pre preliminary negotiations between the parties is preserved as Sorry. being admissible. Oh, oh, Sorry. Oh, oh. E24. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, this is, you, this is what? Contract law. The DIFC contract law, yes, Your Honour. And we're looking at par, uh, Article 51A. Uh, so, so Article 49, sorry, firstly, the intention of the parties, uh, contracts to be interpreted according to the common intention. And then Article 51A, in applying Article 49, regard shall be had to all the circumstances, including preliminary negotiations between the parties. As such, in my submission, DIFC law does diverge from English law in relation to this specific point of contractual interpretation. As such, the English case law references that my learned friend has given in relation to this point are not relevant to this case because they apply to a different law. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there are two DIFC court cases which my learned friend does rely on in relation to this point, which are the Don, John Vitalo and Atlas case and the Mohammed Sadia and Khatib case. So in relation to the John Vitalo case, this is set out at page D8 of my learned friend Skeleton, um, at the very top, it's a continuation of paragraph 25. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, sorry, D8. D8, uh, Your Honour, yes. Paragraph it's, very, it's that top paragraph there, the very top. Yes, for what? Let's see. It's a paragraph 25, continuation of. Right. Let me just reread it. Just give me a second. Of course, Your Honor. D8. 
Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. So my, my learned friend says that uh, in the John Vitalo case, um, and I'll, I'll come to that paragraph in a moment, that pre-contractual negotiations did not elicit a common intention as the form of words were negotiated as between lawyers. And now we can go to this judgment. It's at page D146. And we're looking at paragraph five in particular. I think it's the first sentence, the first oh, three. Oh, oh, oh. Right. Paragraph what? Paragraph five, Your Honor. Yep. Okay. It's the first sentence if you want to read that first, Your Honor. Whose decision is this? It's Jeremy Cook. Right. Yeah. So, so my learned friend suggests that, that what this sentence sets out is a point of principle, which is that when uh, contracts are negotiated by lawyers, um, the pre-contractual negotiations or, um, are, uh, are, not, are not evidence of common intention beyond the ultimate form of words used. In my submission, that, that's not the authority that comes out of that sentence. In my submission, that, that this sentence is simply a finding in relation to the facts of this case. It's simply a finding that in, in, in the preceding exchanges within this case, no common intention could be found beyond an ultimate agreement as to the form of words used. That that's not something that applies to any and all cases. It's not, not the wide principle that my learned friend suggests it to be, which is that whenever, whenever lawyers negotiate the, the document or a contract, no common intention can ever be found in pre-contractual negotiations. Uh, in particular, because if, if my learned friend's uh, interpretation is correct, this would significantly undermine the purpose of Article 51A of the DIFC contract law, as a significant number, perhaps even the majority of contracts are negotiated by lawyers, which means Article 51A would never apply or would very rarely apply when interpreting the majority of contracts. Now, that cannot have been the intention of Article 51A, and indeed, that cannot be, have been the intention of Sir, Sir Jeremy Cook in this sentence. In my submission, this is simply a finding in relation to the facts of that case, and is not a wider principle, as my learned friend suggests. All right. Um, so, in, and secondly, in relation to the Sadia case, now my learned friend makes two submissions in relation where to this. Find, where do I find Sadia? Where do I find it in the bundle? The, the references in my skeleton in learning French skeleton or the case? The case. Uh, I, the reference I D seventy five is one of the references I have, but I think it D starts D seventy. D seventy seven, paragraph eighty eight. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Barry. Give me a second. I think I have it starting on D66. Right. So. And, and remind me where it is in, in the, um, in Mr. Bruce skeleton. Um, D, D8, paragraph 26. Yeah, okay, thanks. And, and, and also at paragraph 41, uh, so paragraph three, uh, D 13, uh, sorry, actually, uh, paragraph 41 generally, uh, 41, one and 41, three, which is at D 13. Thank you. So, so in relation to the, the, so I think my learned friend makes two submissions in relation to this case. 
the first, the one at uh, paragraph 26 and, and 41.3, which is at D8, which is that earlier drafts of an agreement are generally considered, um, are, gen are, are not generally considered in interpreting the terms of concluded agreements. And he, he suggests that the authority from Sadia, which is at paragraph 88, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, supports this point, which is that previous drafts are, are not admissible uh, for interpreting the contract. Um, in my submission, my learned friend's reliance upon Sadia is, is, I'm afraid, uh, misconceived. The most particular reason is if we go to, to page D75, um, which is uh, yeah, D75, which relates to paragraph seven, or I'm looking at paragraph 71 of, yeah. of the Sadia case. In this case, the contract um, had a Lebanese governing law clause. Yeah. As such, and I think I think what what transpired in that case was even though there was a Lebanese governing law clause, submissions were effectively made under both parties uh, under English law. But but in any event, whether it's under Lebanese law or English law, uh, uh, regardless, any any findings in relation to interpretation from this case are not on DIFC law, which specifically preserves pre-contractual negotiations as admissible under Article 51A as I've already submitted. Um, as such, because these findings are on a different governing law to DIFC law, any submissions on this case are entirely irrelevant. Um, e even if Your Honour is, is not with me on that, um, I, I still submit that the point my learned friend seeks to take from Sadia is incorrect. If we go in particular to page D77, Yeah. And, and looking at paragraph 88, which is the paragraph that my learned friend relies upon. Yeah. So the point that my learned friend is making is that earlier drafts are, are not admissible. In fact, the authority, as I read it from 88, is that the, the point that they, they were seeking to make within this case, there wasn't any uh, authority for admiss admissible um, pre-contractual pre negotiations. However, the judge does say that there is some authority for when uh, words have been deleted. Um, I think that's uh, yeah, when the parties have expressly rejected a particular form of words. So yeah. in fact, the, the judge in this case says that there is authority um, for, for when previous uh, forms of contract are admissible, which is not the point that my learned friend is making. The, dif it, the, dif the difficulty always is knowing what assuming even that they are uh, admissible and knowing what, what the lawyers have agreed or rejected simply as a matter of wording or or whether they've re agreed or rejected it simply to, to reflect an intention on the part of their clients not to enter into anything of that sort or to or to, to in other words it, it comes back to the point about drafting again I, I understand um, uh, your honor well in, in this case we're not concerned solely with previous drafts of the agreement. Yeah. We're concerned with the, the comments that the lawyers have made. So it's not simply a moving around or a deletion of words or, or a changing of the words as perhaps envisaged within the Sadia case. What we're concerned with is very specific comments that both parties' lawyers have made in relation to Clause 18. And actually, both parties' lawyers are broadly in agreement. As such, yeah. in my submission, where there is any confusion in relation to how clause 18 is, is to be applied. The, These lawyers, comments... the lawyers might be in agreement, but there's no indication that they're putting forward the views of their clients. In my, in my submission, that the lawyers are, are, are have been instructed by their clients and as such have the authority to, to agree the, the, the relevant yes. terms that are being, are being agreed. Of course they've got authority, um, but you're looking for the intention of the parties not for the attention of the lawyers who have authority to negotiate on their behalf. I mean, for example, the, to take, um, the, the, you, you refer to two particular things. One is um, the comment, our preferences for DIFC courts, Dubai law, on matters other than registration and transfer. That's a typical lawyer remark, isn't it? I mean, they, they may not have even discussed the matter with their clients because the clients leave that sort of thing to them. They have authority, of course, but, but um, and then the, the the other side come back 
um, broadly the same effect, but th th this is talk between lawyers. Well, well in my submission, uh, Your Honour, whilst there's no further evidence um, that, we, that we have in this case in the form of emails fr from the clients or otherwise, th th these are um, indications that have been given uh, clearly on behalf of their clients and, and envisage what, what um, it is intended for the purpose of these agreements, which is to separate out um, or these usual bifurcated clauses, which is to separate out uh, things to do with um, uh, the the registration and transfer, because that that's what usually happens within the, these SPAs. And um, whilst I don't have any evidence on the point, I'm sure that that's what would have been advised by by the lawyers in this case as the contract was being drafted. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, in, 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 th those are my submissions in relation to the relevance, uh, Your Honour. But in my submission. Contractual negotiations are relevant um, and are admissible under DIFC law, including when they're being draft, drafted by lawyers. Yeah. Uh, the, and as such, having regard to the comments made, the, the broader point I was making, Your Honour, and, and even if Your Honour is of, is of the view that the lawyers' uh, uh, comments on these drafts are not representative of intention, that they're certainly representative of what the common usages of these contracts are, which is a separate factor under DIFC contract law for interpretation, um, and uh, which, which would assist in, in, in how Your Honour is supposed to construe Clause 18. And in my submission, they illustrate that this is what the parties intended, um, uh, because that's what common usages of these contracts are to separate out transfer and registration. Um, I, the second... I, can I can understand the common usage uh, of all matters to do with transfer and registration to be uh, dealt with by the courts of the place where the property is, and that, that that's obvious. That's the same as English law, um, but but it doesn't mean that there's any usage to the to the obverse effect, namely that everything not to do with that has to be dealt with elsewhere. I understand, Your Honour. In my submission, the, the the well, I think the in the comments made within the previous uh, drafts, uh, they they suggest that it's only registration and transfer to be dealt with within 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 that um, jurisdiction, and indeed that reflects the nature of these clauses and and what parties usually would intend and common usages when there is a company based in the DIFC and when they effectively want everything else to be dealt with under DIFC law, save what needs to be or has to be dealt with under uh, under the law of where the actual property transaction is taking place. Yeah, OK. Um, right. the, uh, thank you. The second point I, I, I uh, the respondent relies upon is that e even if um, the, the narrow interpretation that I've been arguing for is, is not accepted by the court, this claim does not relate to the property because it doesn't relate to consideration for, for the reasons that I've already made extensive submissions on. Um, as such, I'm not going to repeat myself. Um, Your Honour has my submissions in relation to uh, those issues and they're also already set out within my skeleton. The, the third and final point is that clause 18.1.2 is so clearly applicable to this claim. Now, the respondent submissions are already set out within paragraph 48 of my skeleton. Yeah. But the, the purpose of this clause is to provide the respondent as a holder of stocks in the applicant with a remedy if the applicant fails to list on the stock market. The applicant's requirement to list on the stock market is not a requirement for the purchase of the property. It's not listed anywhere else in the SPA apart from 1713. It's not stated within clause four that this is part of the consideration for the property or, or anything along those lines. This requirement is a new separate obligation which arises after the property purchase is fully completed and the shares have been fully allocated. And it's an obligation of the applicant in relation to the respondent's new status and rights as a shareholder. The applicant's failure to comply with this provision solely concerns the respondent's rights as a shareholder, as a unit holder, in requiring that the applicant be listed on the stock market. A failure to list then requires the applicant to repurchase the shares 
from the respondent. Again, it relates to, relates to the respondent's rights as a holder of shares and requiring the repurchase of these. If the respondent didn't have these shares, it wouldn't have the right um, for these to be repurchased. And indeed, that's uh, why it relates to its rights as a unit holder. And that, as already set out in my skeleton, this claim concerns the failure of a DIFC entity to list on a stock market, and then the consequent obligation of that DIFC entity to purchase back its shares, which are DIFC property, i.e. shares in a DIFC entity. As such, having regard to the purpose of 18.1.2 and 1713 and common usages, it's only logical and reasonable that the parties would have intended this to be dealt with under DIFC law and jurisdiction. This claim does not have anything to do with onshore Dubai. Is that it? There is no connection with on, onshore Dubai. We're only connected with DIFC property and indeed a DIFC entity. As such, it would be illogical for the parties to have intended it to be dealt with by the Dubai courts or under UAE law. To further demonstrate this point, imagine if under clause 1713, the applicant failed to list on the stock market the applicant then complied with its obligation and paid the 44 million dirhams, but the respondent failed to transfer the shares. Which court and law would the applicant logically want to go to for their remedy? Perhaps to request an order for the transfer of shares of a DIFC company. In my submission, almost certainly the applicant would want to come to the DIFC courts because they're concerned with the transfer of shares of a DIFC company. This demonstrates that parties intended disputes under 1713 to be dealt with under 18.1.2. Indeed, my, my, uh, Your Honour, you've already uh, referenced where there has to be some sort of demarcation. In my submission, this clearly illustrates where this demarcation must fall. Now, finally, on this point, before I come to some of my learned friends' responses, and this is a relevant factor for interpretation in relation to the usages. These types of bifurcated clauses are quite common in uh, SPAs such as this, concerning property in onshore Dubai, but companies based in and transfer, transactions based in the DIFC. As such, the business community may well be interested in the implications of, of findings in a case such as this. Um, and it's the respondent's position that the commercial understanding of these bifurcated clauses is that the mechanism of transfer and registration is UAE and Dubai law, and indeed uh, anything relating to the purchase of shares or a failure to list on the stock market is, is under DIFC law. And, and that, that is how the commercial understanding of these clauses should work or would work. As such, for the benefits of commercial certainty, in my submission, this claim falls under 18.1.2. Now, coming to some of my learned friends' uh, responses to some of these points. Um, and we go to D12 of my learned friend's skeleton. Give me a paragraph number. Paragraph 39. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My learned friend uh, repeatedly refers to this sum of 44 million, uh, suggesting that because this figure is being used, this means it's part of the consideration. In my submission, these arguments conflate consideration with what the stated value of the participating shares are. 44 million is simply the value of these shares as defined by the contract. The entitlement to this sum does not stem from any failed consideration, but rather the entitlement stems because of a failure to list on a stock market and a failure sorry, and a requirement to repurchase shares, which just happen to be valued at 44 million. In relation to the points raised at 39.3, I've already dealt with those um, in, in my early submissions and in relation to the points at paragraph 40, uh, as I understand it, two points arise from this. Um, firstly, I would suggest that my learned friend has, has mischaracterized or, or slightly taken out of context the respondent's submission. The respondent's submission is primarily that 1713 does not concern consideration for the property and as such, cannot relate to the property as this has been finalized and consideration discharged. Um, the respondent is not, not necessarily suggesting that no future disputes regarding the property 
uh, can arise once a purchase is complete. But in the context of 1713 alone, the respondent's position is that the applicant's argument that this concerns consideration is incorrect. And as such, these extrapolations are incorrect. Uh, secondly, my learned friend, uh, both within this part of the skeleton and within his submissions today, references clause 1710 and says that, you know, after the property uh, transfer has been affected, there could still be future disputes, such as a dispute related to uh, the rights of entry. Now, now in my understanding, the, there's only one right of entry under the SPA, and now I may be incorrect on this, um, but I think this is at paragraph 9.1 at, at page B28, and it concerns inspections by the purchaser. And it provides that at least two working days prior to uh, written notice to the seller, prior to the transfer date, the purchaser shall be entitled to inspect the property and have a right to entry. As such, the right to entry only arises, as I understand it, before the transfer has taken place in any event. As such, a dispute under 1710 necessarily has to be uh, before the purchase has taken place. And once that has been completed, there wouldn't be a right to claim under that clause. And uh, in relation to the submissions at paragraph 40, uh, subparagraph two of my learned friend's skeleton, um, it's submitted that my learned friend's submission ign ignores the contractual mach machinery and, and it extrapolates logic, which, which is incorrect. Uh, my learned friend ignores the fact that there are clearly continuing obligations after the transfer of shares has been affected. In particular, the requirement for the applicant to list on the stock market as such, and, and that's not the case with the purchase of the property. As such, this illustrates why 1713 relates only to 18.1.2. Now, on this point, I finally want to note that even if contrary my submissions, the court does consider it possible that 1713 relates in some way to the property, which is denied. It's submitted that 1713 is still clearly much closer related to the respondent's position as a unit holder. And the DIFC is, mu is the much more logical jurisdiction and law, given the location of all the assets and the obligations in question in relation to 1713. As such, of the two provisions, the parties have clearly intended 18.1.2 to apply to 1713. Um, uh, unless I can assist any further, Your Honor. No, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to come back on the point I'd rather cut you short on um, about the re reference to pre-conduct pre negotiations? Uh, Your Honour, yes, I did have uh, a few other short points in reply, if, if Your Honour would permit me to make those as well, that I can deal with. Yeah, take, take, take your course. Um, well, if I may deal with that preliminary negotiation point first, Your Honour. Um, what my learned friend and the respondent is, is seeking to do is not to rely on evidence of preliminary negotiations. What they're specifically seeking to rely upon is comments exchanged by lawyers when exchanging drafts of the SPA with no evidence as to why certain positions or certain languages were being proposed, to what extent the clients had agreed or even been consulted with that. Therefore, I don't dispute what my learned friend says under Article 51 um, of the DIFC contract law that preliminary negotiations may be taken into consideration for the purposes of interpretation. What I'm saying here is in line with what Sir uh, Jeremy Cook, Justice Sir Jeremy Cook in, in the John Batalo case uh, and Justice Wayne Martin in the Sadia case found, is that the court is unlikely to be assisted purely by looking at drafts that have been exchanged by lawyers who are exchanging comments in respect of language. Um, I would say that particular example here um, is exposed because when we look at the drafts and what the respondents say, they say, well, look, for example, you had always intended disputes to be resolved in the DIFC in respect of the property. Well, that the court's going to find no assistance from that because the clear and unequivocal wording that's agreed and executed in the SPA provides specifically for the Dubai courts. And that is the very reason why Sir Jeremy Cook in, in John Batalo says that you're re the court's really not going to be assisted by exchanges of commentaries by lawyers, because that's a very specific thing that's being done. It doesn't go to the actual 
evidence of what the party's common intentions are. So it, it doesn't assist them. And, and we aren't dealing here with evidence of preliminary negotiations. We're only dealing with the evidence the respondent seeks to rely on, which is purely exchanges of drafts and comments on that. Uh, and uh, that, that point arguably is made good because if one could rely on, for example, the drafts as being pre-negotiation um, documents, well then one of the comments exchanged, and it's at B308, specifically says that under clause 17.13, that my clients will not provide any compensation in respect of not listing. Uh, therefore, the only the, the, the only alternative to that is that 17.13 therefore must be in relation to the property. But I'm not relying on that, um, Your Honour, because as I say, you can't, or generally speaking, drafts of previous agreements are inadmissible and not really of assistance to the court. Therefore, um, I don't dispute the fact preliminary negotiations may be admissible um, for the purposes of constructing such clause. What I'm saying is in this case, is that there's a difference between pre-negotiation evidence and just exchanges of drafts and the DIFC authorities um, tend or, or the approach of the DIFC court has generally lean towards not relying on drafts exchanged by lawyers as being demonstrative of what the party's intentions are. Um, so, my lord, that deals with that specific point. Um, if I may just address some, very briefly, just some other points that my learned friend made. The, the, the yes. most supportive one is in respect of clause 7.7, .7, because what my learned friend says is that once the allotment and issue of shares has taken place, then the consideration is discharged and settled in full under 4.1.3. And then he further went on to say that clause 7.7 .7 is, is put connected to the property and would fall under 18.1.1 because that only kicks in when consideration has not been discharged, i.e. he says it only kicks in when the shares have not been issued or allotted. Um, the consequences of which um, he said was that Dr. Rothman is not a unit holder because those shares have not been issued and allocated to them. Therefore, it, it, it does modify 4.1.3 because there's no good consideration. However, uh, in my submission, that's not correct because 7.7, .7, which is at B28, if I can ask your honour to go to it, I have it. Are limited to where the shares have not been issued or allotted. What, what it actually says at 7.7 .7 is, if the shares are not issued and allotted to the subscriber or the original share certificate is not delivered to the subscriber within 60 days of the transfer date for any reason whatsoever. And then it goes on to 7.1 .1 that it may be a cash consideration. So what 7.7 .7 does imagine is that there is a situation where the shares are issued and allotted, but if the share, the original share certificate is not provided within 60 days of the transfer date, then it modifies or it may modify the consideration due under 4.1.3. And 4.1.3 as the third part of consideration only refers to the issuance and the, the allotment of the shares. It doesn't refer to a share certificate needing to be provided within 60 days. So 7.7 .7 isn't limited, as my learned friend says. It's, it's not together, it's one or the other. It's either the shares are not issued and allotted, in which case you can have this remedy, or even if they have been, if you don't have the original share certificate, then the consideration may be modified and you can get a cash equivalent or return the property. And we say that where it's not limited to that, it also captures the 17.13 um, is, is even cleaner for that because it's got nothing to do at all with the subscription rights. And what that does is modify 17.13 to say that you get the value of the shares. The value of the shares are ascribed in, in the agreement. I don't agree with what my learned friend says. It's a set value for the shares at 44 million. And the reason it was done for that is because it was going to be part of the consideration. Therefore, when 17.13, as I say, modifies 4.13, they no longer want the shares, they want the cash, and that's the value that's given to it because it makes up the 110 million purchase price. So it's all part of one core bargain. So my learned friend, I disagree with my learned friend's interpretation of 7.7. .7. It's not as restrictive as he says. The second point I wish to just address is, is in respect of um, the differences in 18.11 and 18.12. What my learned friend said is, well, they're in effect the same thing because they both arise out of disputes in connection with something. 
And he said that I was basically spitting hairs on the language, as it's broadly the same. And with respect to, to that argument, I, I disagree again. Clause 18.1.1, as I've already submitted, is much broader than 18.1.2, because it's not just as the judge disappeared. Uh, yeah, yes, he's, he's disappeared for me as well. I don't know if there's anyone on from the DIFC, but um, the judge has, I think, dropped off the call for the time being. Can you hear me? Yes, Your Honour. Yes, Your Honour. Um, um, you probably noticed when I went dead, um, or did you carry on talking for another five minutes? Uh, no, I did. I did notice you dropped out of the image. I hope I did it in good time, at least. Right. to be frozen again you are is that the same for you alex yeah it is yes yes Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, I can hear you and see you. Yes, Your Honour. Right, do you want, Mr. Um, Baru, do you want to go back to the point you were dealing with? Yes, I, I believe the point I was dealing with before we lost connection, Your Honour, was about, um, it was my response to my land of friends submission that 18.1.1 and 18.1.2 are the same. Yeah. In terms of the language and, and what, my learned friend said is, is effectively that we were splitting hairs on that. Um, and, and I would disagree with that analysis. 18.1.1, um, uh, as I previously submitted, is much broader than 18.1.2. Um, and 18.1.2 does not include this additional otherwise in connection to, the equivalent of which might be something like arising out of or in connection with the subscriber as a unit holder or which is otherwise in connection to the subscription shares which may then have allowed a much wider interpretation to that clause to allow other um, issues to fall under it but in my submission 18.1.2 is limited and it's mostly limited to issues arising out of clause 7 uh, and in my submission under the S SPA the kinds of disputes which would concern the subscriber as a unit holder are predominantly containing clause seven, and, and they would, for example, deal with issues such as whether the participating shares have been issued free of all encumbrances or credited as fully paid up, um, dealing with the KYC issues, everything related to the subscription agreement. Everything else is under the SBA concerning a transaction to do with the property and is otherwise in connection with the property and therefore falls under 18.1.2. So it's not a case of we're splitting hairs over the language. There is clearly a difference between the two and 18.1.1 is, in my submission, intended to be the broader and wider of the two to capture all of the issues falling under the SPA dealing with the transaction concerning the property. The, <laughs> the final point I just wish, wish to touch upon is, is the, the criticism my learned friend advances about my example about a third party holding the shares and, and what he says is well in that scenario 18.1.2 would never be effective and could never be used because he's transferred the share out well that's correct if he transferred the shares to a third party he'd no longer enjoy the rights as a subscriber so 18.1.2 would never be triggered because he'd never have a claim arising as a subscriber but the point is in, in that example is that the seller does not need to hold the actual shares to trigger the obligation under 17.13 because it is an automatically triggered obligation. When the long stop date is reached, um, the payment is due insofar as my clients haven't been listed on a stock exchange. The transfer of the shares 
um, happens only after that part of it has triggered, i.e. there's been no listing and there's, there is a payment that's made. It's only once the payment that is made is the obligation to transfer the shares to my client. Under second. Now, if, that, if the seller no longer has that at the time, he's either got to affect the transfer from a third party, for example, a limited company that he's incorporated, or my clients would then have a claim in respect of the shares not being returned, and therefore we'd have to pursue it that that avenue. But it all goes to the point that when you look at 17.13, it's to do with the obligations and the rights as a purchaser and a seller and not as, as a subscriber. And that's why we say 17.13 at, at its very heart and its core is to do with unpaid consideration towards the property. That's why the provision is specifically in there. Um, uh, my Lord, in respect of the other points my learned friends made, I don't intend to go over old ground again. I think I've, I've addressed most of those either in my skeleton or in my old submissions. So unless there's anything further I can assist your honour with, um, that concludes my reply. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I note that I was sent yesterday and today um, your both your uh, costs estimates. Do I take it you want me to as, uh, assess costs summarily? At the end of when I've reached my decision. Yes. Well, rather than have them taxed by the registrar. That's it. Is that the same for you, Mr. Burrow? Uh, I, I think it is. I think it is. Yes, Your I'll just double check with my with my client. But I think I think our position is summary assessment. If if Your Honour is going to give it a judgment today. I'm not going to give it today. I'm going to give it within the, within the next few days. Okay. Uh, one moment, Your Honour. In which case, then, uh, Your Honour, if you're reserving judgment, would we, we, our position is still we would ask for summary assessment of the cost, but yeah. would we be in, uh, put in further submissions in writing in that respect? Do you need Do you need further submissions? Well, it, why, why don't you? Uh, what, what do you What do you want to say that can't be said now? Well, I, I suppose much of it depends, Your Honour, on, on the, the outcome of. Yeah. Basically, if you win, you get your costs, and if you lose, you. Yes, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. That the principle of it, it would more, it would be more to do with the quantum side of things. If, 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 if there's anything either of you want to say about quantum, let us say it now. Uh, the only point I would make in respect of, of quantum, um, Your Honour, is is that when you look at the two schedules, that the respondents' costs are obviously much higher, and, yeah. and more time as as been spent by them in, in preparing the application, which, which, uh, albeit not an absolute rule, as a general rule, it is the applicant who carries the burden um, of, of these applications in both preparing them uh, as well as getting the bundles together and everything else that goes on. So all, all I would say is that the quantum um, put forward by the respondents is, is, is very high, particularly compared to the, the amount that's sought by um, the applicant. I think I, I would leave it as that as a general point. Yeah. The um, the only point that I, I'd raise, Your Honour, in response, I think um, I've had a, a quick look at my um, at, at the uh, the applicants' costs, and um, that, that's because they were filed this morning, which is in, in breach of, of the requirement to file at twenty four hour, hours before the hearing. Um, mm -hmm. and as such, that that failure is to be taken into account when deciding. What order to make about costs uh, pursuant to Rule uh, 3837. Um, in relation to the, the quantum of, of the applicant's costs, in my submission, this this is a a, a not a straightforward application um, in relation to a very large amount in dispute, and as such, the the costs incurred by the respondent are entirely reasonable and proportionate, having regard to um, the the potential implications if jurisdiction was refused and the um, the issues that would arise therefrom. As such, it's submitted that the, the, uh, applicant, the respondents' costs are entirely reasonable in, in the circumstances. I note that there's no specific submission other than the very general one, which is that they're just more than more than the applicant, um, that there's nothing specific about any particular item, as I understand it, unless I misheard my learned friend. If, um, can I just ask you about your costs? Um, why do you need, apart from yourself, why do you need three lawyers attending at the hearing? Uh, 
So uh, uh, Your Honour, we we had um, uh, Richard Davies attending because he is a witness in this. He's, a, he's given a witness statement in this case, and it was just in case um, the uh, the court required uh, any evidence to be heard from from that witness statement. Otherwise, there is a, um, a senior associate and and a trainee, um, which which are reasonable in the circumstances, Your Honour. Right, and what about um, work done on documents? Seem to be almost identical amount of work done by two people. Seven, 17 hours each on documents. Seems, seems on the high side. One moment, Your Honour. Yes, yeah, so one of those is is by is by a trainee, Your Honour. So it was um, um, it's a reduced rate involved and uh, in, in my submission appropriate in the circumstances of getting getting all of the documents arranged and assembled together um, for, for what was submitted in this case in particular in, in the witness statement and all the various exhibits to uh, Mr Davies witness witness statement. Right. And um, Yeah. All right. Well, if neither of you has any any more detail to say about the schedules of costs, are you are you both content that um, costs follow the event? Whoever wins gets their costs, and whoever loses pays them. Yes, Your Honour. Yes. Yes. Oh. Your Honor. Very well. Thank you both very much then for your very helpful written submissions and your oral presentation. Thank you. I'll, I'll try and let you have a decision in the course of next week. Thank you very Thank much. You.